Thanks for checking out this movie review video. So this is for the 1976 film Eaten Alive, and it's a Toby Hooper film. And since I've now covered a few Toby Hooper films, I'm actually going to put a playlist on my channel for Toby Hooper films. Uh, crazy enough, I have not reviewed Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Go figure. I mean, I did Poltergeist, and I did... Uh, why am I blanking on the other one? Life Force. I did Poltergeist and Life Force... Now, obviously, I'm doing Eaten Alive, and I will also be doing The Fun House soon. Eventually, I'll get to Texas Chainsaw, which, you know, I had to represent Toby Hooper for this one. But eventually, I'll get there. But when I do that, I think I'm going to go through the whole series. But anyway, talking about Eaten Alive, which I will be rating on two different scales as just like a film in the entire pantheon of films, and also as a so bad it's good film, because this is so bad it's good. And... From the top, let me go ahead and shout out to Neville Brand, who played Judd in this film. This is a bad film. Like, it, it, it's a bad film. That's why I'm going to rate it on a so bad it's good scale in addition to the regular one. But Neville Brand as Judd did a phenomenal job with that role. Can we all agree on that one? Put your comments down there. Like I said, directed by Toby Hooper, uh, this was two years after the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Massacre and three years before doing the TV series for Salem's Lot. Now, one of the very, very interesting things about this, when you watch this film, just consider that during the filming of this movie, Steven Spielberg supposedly approached Toby Hooper and asked him if he wanted to direct E.T., now, obviously, he then got him for Poltergeist, so I don't know if he had done E.T., would he have done Poltergeist then, but, you know, your mind starts thinking about these things and, like, what would a Toby Hooper E.T. be like? I kind of want to know. Would it have been a little more horror-related or not? Don't know. This film was written by Alvin L. Fast, who also wrote scripts for Bummer, Black Shampoo, and Satan's Cheerleaders. Uh, as well as Marty Rustum, uh, who wrote script for Evils of the Night, and Kim Hankel, who wrote scripts for The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Unseen, Last Night at the Alamo, and Butcher Boys. Now, uh, Marty Rustum, just so you know, was a producer, and apparently there were issues with the producers and Toby Hooper on this film, so much so that Hooper ended up leaving the film before it was done, in production, and I believe it was a cinematographer had to take over for some of the shots. So I think Rustum may have been one of those people that he was at odds with. This film is actually supposedly loosely based on Joe Ball, who owned a bar, who owned a bar in Texas with a live alligator and allegedly murdered multiple women and fed them to the gator. He actually ended up committing suicide before he was arrested by the police for these suspected crimes. So it's not confirmed that this is what was going on, but it is theorized so much so that he was actually going to be arrested and, um, I don't know about necessarily charged, but at least questioned, and he committed suicide before that. So I don't know, but it's interesting to know that it's kind of based off of something in reality. There was a submerged and a walking model for the crocodile that they used on set, and the submerged one actually spent about 48 hours in water at one point, so much so that it got too waterlogged to actually work. So they had to slow down production in order to wait for that model to dry out. They literally, I think, put it out in the sun and let it dry out for enough time where they could use it again, which... Honestly, um, did you really need to, in my opinion? Because, like, the gators don't look... I, I'm sorry, it's crocodiles in this. The crocodiles don't look good. Let's be honest. They don't look good. They look hokey. They look ridiculous. So, honestly, in certain scenes... And you're you're not even really seeing them that often in the film, either. So, in certain scenes, you probably could have just had someone splashing in the water and just make them think that that was a crocodile. You know? Just saying. Uh, this film was, was filmed under, under the name Death Trap, which, I mean, makes sense because people literally just keep coming to Judd's bar slash motel, I believe. I, actually, I don't even know if it has a bar component. It's like his house slash, slash a motel. Um, very weird, very weird. Uh, in the beginning, all the frog sounds and the moon gives you that very much of a swamp vibe that they're obviously going for with this. But the music is super, super odd and seems very out of place. The music in general in this film, not a fan of. It kind of sounds like the style, 
if people are familiar, Music Concrete, which was basically this uh, style of just using like objects, like found objects to make noises and then kind of stringing it together to create music. Uh, I think the person who was best known for this was Philip Glass, who also did some scores for films. Uh, there was one I watched kind of recently, and I was like, oh, man. And that was actually done well. This one, it sounds like it's like a knockoff Philip Glass score that's just not sounding great. It's very weird. I do like the fact that Robert England is in this as Buck, and uh, starting with Buck is kind of a crazy way to get things going. It makes you think, this is wild. Um, and I'm assuming that his opening line, my name is Buck, and I like to, you know, um, I assume that was taken from this film by Quentin Tarantino when he also incorporated it into Kill Bill. Um, that's something Tarantino has been well known to do, take lines and take inspiration and literally lift things directly from older films that he was a fan of. So I'd be interested to know if that was the case with Eaten Alive. I, I'm assuming yes. The beginning scene begs the question, is Eaten Alive referring to a crocodile? Or is it the women metaphorically being eaten alive by a patriarchal society? Or just the fact that Judd himself is, in a sense, eating people alive? And there even is that portion towards the end of the film, which I'll talk about when I get there again, where it's kind of mirroring like what's going on with Judd at the same time as what's going on with the crocodile. And they're both in a predatory mode going after people. So I think it's pretty obvious that that's what... That's kind of a parallel they were trying to throw in there. The talk about the crocodile not being like an alligator sets up the premise that characters are not safe on land. Now, I thought that's why they were planning that idea, and that would have been a good idea to plant that idea and then have the crocodile get out and be all over the place. But in the end, the crocodile barely ever leaves its mud swamp hole, I guess. And the only time it's really like, on land is when it goes under the house to go after the little girl. Like, that's it. So it's kind of like, okay, like you spent this time explaining that it can go on the land and then it sets the expectation for the audience that even on land people aren't safe, so you should have used that more, in my opinion. The script is not great. You could tell from the get-go this woman was going to get it, uh, Her although her pitch por pitchfork death is quite interesting. Uh, she gets pitchforked and then she gets thrown to the crocodile. Um, that's the woman in the very beginning who started her time at Hattie's, having her situation with Buck, and then decided to leave, and then she goes to Judd, and then Judd's like, oh yeah, and then he just like, like a switch just flips with him. So very early on you get the idea that he's not stable, that either there's like a split personality situation going on, or he just flies off the handle very easily, or... There's something, because the other thing is all his rambling. A lot of his rambling, which I think is one of the big points you can point, one of the things you can point to as being a great thing that Neville Brand did with that character, like doing a character that's not all there or at sometimes is and other times isn't, I assume is not easy. So he, he did a really good job with that, but they do a good job of setting it up so you know he's very unstable. So you kind of don't know when he's going to fly off the handle and do something insane. It's a very odd choice to show Judd just hanging out singing, juxtaposed with shots of a caged monkey in red lighting. Uh, that's something they did early on when they introduced Judd. It's weird. You know, there are a lot of weird choices in this film, but, you know, just having these types of shots where there's obviously nothing going on, plus all those shots of... Judd rambling like I get it like you want to show that rambling to like show you what's going on in his head and his mental state but I think they did a lot of that or a, a lot more than they needed and I it, a lot of it ended up feeling like they were just throwing it in there to stretch runtime honestly which may very well have been the case I like how the mother is telling her kid to calm down after her dog was eaten by the crocodile, and then she herself is also freaking out at that exact same time. So it was just kind of, it made me chuckle a little bit because she's like, calm down, calm down, and she's like flipping out. So how's the kid going to calm down when A, her dog was just eaten, and B, you are currently freaking out? It's then weird that they use the dog being eaten to kind of showcase the marital issues between the mother and father, 
Like, that's just a weird kind of, like, side thing that happened where they start, like, fighting and then, like, all this extra stuff comes out having to do with their marriage and you're just like, is this, like, the time for this? Like, is this going to be important to the film? And obviously it's not, so it's kind of, it's weird. And then <laughs> you get the barking that goes on with the character of Roy, the father, like, and then it seems like he basically then has, like, a mental break, kind of like Judd was having. And it's just like, I don't know. A lot of odd choices in this film. If you can explain this to me, please, in the comments. Uh, it's funny how people actually keep rolling into this weird motel out in the middle of nowhere. It kind of makes me think of something like a Motel Hell. But Motel Hell, like, they were trapping, like, they were setting people up with accidents on the road and then taking them to their place. This is like the lazy version of that, where like he's not even, Judd's not even going out to find these people. They're stupidly just showing up, and a lot of it, it just doesn't make sense. These people are just like randomly showing up. I mean, I get why the father, Harvey, and uh, Libby, the sister of the first woman who's killed, I get why they show up, because they're looking for their daughter slash sister, but everyone else, like, not really. Maybe Buck, because he he lives in the area and he knows that place is somewhere he can go to have relations with women. Although Judd's not a fan of that, obviously. Where did this wacky behavior from Roy come from? Such a crazy shift in the film. Yeah. That whole thing where he's like barking and losing it and saying that it, that his eyeball came out and then looking for it on the floor. I was like, is he on drugs? Is that's what's going on? He's like tripping right now. It was very weird. How about the scythe attack on Roy, by the way? This is the first time the scythe is actually used by Judd, and he keeps bringing it back. It's a weird instrument of death because, I mean, it looks very crazy and cool and menacing, but if you consider it, like, who would use this? You don't have a whole lot of control of it, and the reach on that is so far that, like, if anyone gets close up to you, you're in trouble, you know? So it doesn't really make sense that this guy would be using this. I assume he has this tool because he goes around and kind of, like, takes care of, you know, grass and weeds that get out of control around his property with that. But it's just a weird choice, but sets up some kind of fun deaths. Most of, uh, the, the, probably the most fun of which was the one with, um, with Harvey where he gets it like in the, where he like hits him in the head, in the back of the neck is what it's insinuated. It doesn't show it. And then it brings it like halfway through. And then he's kind of like walking around with it stuck. Um, that was pretty solid. But then the, the croc that finishing, that finishes the fight, uh, with the scythe when Roy's getting it with the scythe with the croc just, like, busting through the railing and then just, like, grabbing him and taking him. I like that touch as well. And it, it does show at that moment this competition, this predatory competition then between Judd and the crocodile for, like, who is the apex predator. Just saying. I see some stuff in this. I get the point of all Judd's nonsensical rambling, but with how much it's done, it feels like it's there as a way to stretch the runtime. Yes, I already talked about that. You had to know that Miss Hattie wouldn't admit to having seen Harvey's daughter. When Harvey goes there, it's like, oh, I was told that she worked here or stayed here or whatever. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. Um, what did you think was going to happen? So, like, that's kind of wasted time. You know, like, we didn't need that. All they needed to do was talk to someone who said, oh, she was at Hattie's, but then she went to Judd's. Like, that's it. There's nothing added by that scene of them going to Hattie's at all. Why is Judd surprised when he hits Harvey with the scythe, by the way? That was a weird reaction from him. Like, he comes out of nowhere, like, good jump scare. He comes out of nowhere at Harvey with the scythe and hits him with it. And then he's like, <gasps> like, what did he think he was doing? Like, or, or is that, is that one of those moments that shows you that his mental shift has happened? And at that point, he's kind of more even keel and realizing, oh my gosh, I just blacked out and just did something horrible. I don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. You can theorize, but no one knows. What's with all the sla uh, slapping in the bar scene? Uh, and come to think of it, this film is actually pretty slap heavy. There's a lot of slapping that goes on. Men on women, men on men. I don't think any... Oh, I, I think that the wife had slapped Roy, so... There's that. So lots of slapping. It reminded me of a Giallo film. Giallo films typically have plenty of slapping going on, but it's just very odd. And what's with the scene where Libby is hanging out with the sh with Sheriff Martin at the bar? 
And also, why is Sheriff Martin even really in this film? Because he doesn't really do much of anything, honestly. I mean, he's he's kind of like barely there, and when he's there, it's like these very mundane whatever scenes, like him hanging out with Libby in the bar. Like, why are we even doing this? It's very odd. And then he has a, that bit of a confrontation with Buck, and you're like, oh, is this going somewhere? And it's like, not really. I mean... All that did was serve to get Buck out of the bar to take that woman with him to Judd's. But Buck could have just chosen to just show up there in the first place, cut that whole scene out. Very weird choices in this film. Very weird. I think the best parts of the film are actually when Judd freaks out about Buck being around. They're also, they're almost Nicolas Cage level freakouts in my opinion. And this goes back to what I was saying about Neville Brand having done a really good job as Judd. And it's just fun to watch. Uh, I would rewatch this film just for that. And because it does fit in the, like, the So Bad It's Good category. And I am a fan of So Bad It's Good films. You end up forgetting about the kid crawling around and the woman tied up to the bed, which was the kid's mother, until they finally go back to both of them. And it's like they go back to both of them at the same time when maybe they should have paced it a little bit better, where they go back to the girl, and then a little bit later they go back to the woman tied to the bed. But by the time you get to them, you're just like... Are we doing anything with these people? <laughs> like, they were forgotten about for so long. Is there going to be significance? Obviously, the most significant one is the little girl because the crocodile comes after her. And, you know, come to think of it, there just isn't enough crocodile in this film. Like, that's one of my, that's probably my biggest complaint. It's so much focused on Judd and not enough focused on the crocodile itself. And, like, I get what they're doing with this comparison of, like, Predator versus Predator with Judd and the Crocodile, but could we have just had more of the Crocodile? Or just solely focused on the Crocodile? I don't know. It would have been better that way, in my opinion. You could see Buck, Buck's death coming a mile away. He literally just, like, stands right next to this open space in the railing where the Crocodile is. Just Like, it looks like he's waiting to be pushed. It literally looks like he's waiting to be pushed. And I was just like, let's just get to it. Let's get this over with. His death is okay. And I think he may have been the only one other than the dog actually eaten alive. I don't know. I like how Libby just walks in totally oblivious to what's taken place in Judd's. Like all this killing, all this craziness had literally just happened. And Libby walks in, sees nothing, hears nothing, and then just goes to her room that she's rented, she's renting for Judd and just starts getting undressed. And I was just like, what is happening? <laughs> like, why is she so oblivious? It's so weird. A lot of choices in this film, weird. At the end, it appears they're trying to draw a parallel between Judd and the Croc as they're both going after their prey at the exact same time. They keep going between the two, obviously mirroring each other, being predators. And then it's kind of this question of which one is worse, which one is more the predator. Now, in the end, obviously, the crocodile wins, proving that crocodiles will always be better at killing than humans, in a hand-to-hand -hand situation, at least. But yeah. Uh, so the croc, apex predator. And how about that freeze frame of the floating wooden leg at the end? <laughs> Judd's wooden leg. Well, when there was the reveal initially of Judd having a wooden leg, which, like, I thought he was just limping in the first place, just a limp. I didn't know the wooden leg would come into play. Uh, as soon as he revealed it and it had, like, the teeth marks on it, I was like, oh, wow. Like, yet another weird twist to this thing. And I'm assuming they just did the whole wooden leg thing just to be able to have it be the freeze frame at the end of the film. Just be like, and his wooden leg floats up to the top. Eerie how it just stays there, reminding you that he's just been eaten. It's like, very weird. Once again, the music in this is super whacked out, super weird, not a big fan of it. Uh, it looks like it's shot on a soundstage, which it was shot on a soundstage. It was one of those sound stages where you could have like an actual water tank. So, uh, yeah, the whole thing shot in a soundstage, and it looks like it. It 100% does. The other thing is that red lighting that keeps showing up in this film doesn't really help that situation. It's also just a weird, weird, weird choice. What is this red lighting from? I assume it's like the a neon sign or something, but I never saw any neon sign that was casting this red light. I don't know why this red light is being used. It's super weird. Can any, 
excuse me, can anyone explain this to me? Go ahead in the comments. I would love to know. They also go really, really hard on the fog, at least early on in the film. Like, I'm good with some fog in a film, but when you're just pumping it, pumping it, pumping it out, it gets to a point where it's just comedic, and it gets to the comedic point within this film. It's just ridiculous how much fog they're pumping there. That person who was working that fog machine, hope they got paid well, because they worked hard. A large part of the film is characters meandering around the set with random events happening. It's a very non sequitur, this film, and once again, that points to the script just being very kind of like aimless, to be honest. There's a decent concept there, I just think the execution was not great at all, but I hope we can all agree that this is a so bad it's good film. So let me rate this film, in the pantheon of films, rating it as like a legit film, I'm going to have to give it one and a half stars, there's not a whole lot great to it, but... I'm going to double it up on the So Bad It's Good rating. I'm going to give it three stars on So Bad It's Good. It's not amazingly bad, but I would rewatch it again. And it's enjoyable from a So Bad It's Good perspective. And I would like to see this get the Joe Bob Briggs treatment on The Last Drive-In, which is coming up soon. Just saying, that would be fun. Those have already been taped, so... Or, sorry, recorded. We don't use tapes anymore. Shows you where my mind is, <laughs> especially when I'm watching something from 1976 that legitimately seems like it was one of those films that people rented in the video store and were just like, what's this weird looking thing? And just rented it based off the VHS cover art. Um, yeah, because it is an interesting image. But anyway, those are my thoughts on Eatin' Alive. Like I said, I'm going to have a review up for The Fun House, which the day I'm putting this up, I believe I'm going to put it up the next day. So you should have more Toby Hooper. And like I said, I'm adding a Toby Hooper playlist on my channel so you can check that stuff out. Do me a quick favor, hit subscribe if you haven't already. That is your way to repay me if you like this video or any video I've ever done. It is quick. It is painless. It costs you no money, and I appreciate it greatly. So uh, if you want to keep me encouraged, keep me going making these reviews. Oh, and also if you have recommendations on films you would really like me to review, you can go ahead and put them in the comments of pretty much any of my videos. I'll get it. I'll read it. And if I get enough people asking for something, I will probably go ahead and review it. So just know that. But please hit subscribe. Also hit the notification bell button. And then you will know when I'm putting up new videos, which at this point I'm doing for a week, which I think is a good amount. But regardless, I really thank you for taking your time to watch this video. And until next time, keep it brutal.